But we are now halfway through the fourth season of True Detective, and it really feels like there's a lot more story to go because the pacing has been pretty slow, which is usually pretty good for shows like this that are about a mystery, give you little bits of information as the show goes on. But I still have mixed feelings about the show overall. But this might be my favorite episode so far because it's mostly focused on the case. The things I don't like about the show so much are the things about the characters' personal lives, and a lot of the characters just aren't necessarily likable per se, but I am interested in the mystery itself. I like investigations, and there's a lot of intriguing imagery, and I love the setting. I, I, even, I love Jodie Foster, although her, I don't necessarily like her character so much. She definitely sells it, like I've said in reviews before. But uh, there's definitely more supernatural stuff in this episode. So we've talked about that before. We'll get to that when we get to that. But that's definitely the theme of this season is the great unknown, so to speak. But there's a lot to like in this episode as well. It's just those things, those issues I still have with it that's still my opinion. As of, as of right now, it's just like the show's good enough to entertain me for a while. Is it going to have the lasting staying power of season one? Definitely not, in my opinion. Uh, unless the ending is just like 10 out of 10, absolutely amazing. But that's just my opinion on it right now. I think we'll burn through the, the breakdown in this episode. Uh, right here, we start off with a flashback scene. And this is the girl who was murdered, the cold case. And we have Navarro here to arrest her for property damage at a protest. She obviously was protesting the mine. And the environmental factor is a big part of this episode as well. And it seems to be a kind of a conspiracy going on. As the episode goes on, we got police who are hiding evidence. We have the water turning black. And there are still births as well. And that's part of this uh, scene right here that's what it's establishing so we get to see the connection between the dead girl and navarro and they don't like that she's here it seems to be uh, the alaska native uh, people have their own birthing facility somebody's ha giving birth right here and she just happened to arrest her at the same time i kind of like how the girl's like I'm finishing this. You could shoot me if you want. Um, and, and I like that Navarro gets a little bit of humanization in this episode. Here we get to see her helping out. You know, she gets, she feels like a fish out of water, so to speak, because she's definitely out of place here. The people don't want her here, but she's just kind of thrown into this situation. So I, I like this first scene. You know, it's definitely uh, the most human we've seen her yet. Uh, Navarro that is and we get to see this dead girl and why why she matters so much we get some hints at that and then they think the baby is dead for a bit they got to do CPR on the baby and then the baby uh, starts crying and is okay so uh, you know we get to humanize the dead person we get to see that you know she cares about her community she wants to help people all of that so it's it's nice to see the dead person, because it was just planted as a thing that happened in the past. We don't have a necessarily a, a, an interest in that. We don't necessarily care about that. Now we have a more of a reason to care. And that's a previous episode. I was like, there's a lot of little seeds here, but they don't give us reasons to care. This episode does a little bit to unfurl that. We get some of the answers we wanted in previous episodes. It's still the pacing of it. You know, I might question the unveiling of information. I get they want to intrigue us and hook us and whatnot. But um, it would have been better to have some of this stuff up front. So including this, which I'm glad they added. So they seem to have addressed my complaint, I suppose. But yeah, I like this first scene here. And it hints at things to come. And now we're out on the ice with Navarro. And there's a search crew looking for the guy that is missing. So... Um, I was confused a little bit at the end of the last episode. Somebody was missing out of the Frozen guys, and they expected him to be there, but he wasn't. I thought maybe he unfroze and then uh, was wandering around. That's not the case. They just thought, assumed he was there. He wasn't. He's the only one who's unaccounted for from the scientific facility, so they're out searching for him. But the young detective's dad, the guy who's shady, who seems to be hiding evidence and stuff, He's hiring his own friends and connections. So he's connected with some weird groups and things go awry by the end of the episode with this search. But um, very quickly, there is a scene 
with Navarro looking on the ice. I guess we get back to that after. I've never actually talked about this intro scene. And I, I like the visuals, the way it's cut together. Um, I, I like Billie Eilish. I like her music. I'm actually a fan. You know, I've listened to all of her music so far. I just felt like I've heard... Or maybe it's just because I've heard this song so many times. It just kind of comes off as maybe a little corny. They just pick a popular pop song that's out right now. I don't know. That's probably a nitpick. That's why I haven't really talked about it before. But hey, I might as well, you know. So here we're back in the station with Danvers. And I looked it up. His name is Peter Pryor. His dad's name is Hank. So hopefully I can remember that now. And they're talking about the guy in the hospital. The uh, beginning of the previous episode, we had the guy whose arm fell off. And he was screaming. He's thawing out in the hospital. We're in an evidence locker. We're dealing with the trailer we found in the last episode. The secret relationship with uh, the dead girl. You know, what was going on there? Why is it a secret? And stuff like that. And here we have a flashback scene of um, the last case that Danvers and Navarro worked on together. We have Peter asking Danvers about that situation. What was it that led them to no longer work together? And we get a, a story about, it kind of reminded me of the um, No More Half Measures monologue from Breaking Bad that Mike gave to Walt. It kind of reminded me of that a little bit, where there's a domestic abuse situation and they didn't have evidence or anything to arrest the guy and it was too late, the woman was dead. And she, Danvers lies to Peter in this scene about what happened. She tells Peter that... Uh, the man was already dead when they got there. This is awesome. This is great because it gives us a reason to care. It shows us what happened. It's a lot better than just, oh, something bad happened in the past, you know. And that's just the thing with the pacing and stuff. If we got this scene in an earlier episode, I would be more intrigued, you know. So here we got uh, Navarro out on the ice. And she has an orange. They, I don't know why they had oranges. I'm sure it's symbolic of something. You know, the color orange. What is it telling us? You know, we got uh, the fruit from the Godfather. I don't know. Maybe that's a connection. Maybe I'm reading into it. But I always think of when I see oranges in film, I think of that. <laughs> I don't know if that's off base or not. She starts hearing voices. And we find out a little bit more about her mother in this episode. Her mother uh, had a, was a little crazy. We kind of had that hint of that at the conversations with the sister and you know the the little brief flashback that we got so we get a little bit about that in this episode and now navarro's starting to hear things as well but um i think it's good they're going for a supernatural thing there here we got a scene looking through the evidence from the trailer and i like them working together you know the the directing is decent because like they they are definitely in sync like they work together closely for a while and they don't need to tell us that directly. They show it to us by how they're behaving. Which I, I like that a lot. That's definitely the show don't tell aspect of screenwriting. That they drill into your head when you go to screenwriting classes. This is something you'll hear over and over again. It's just very basic writing advice. Here's a great example of that. And you know there's other areas of the script where they don't do that. But this is definitely solid we find a photo from uh, longer back than they thought why are they keeping their relationship a secret and then peter comes in and they and navarro kind of bullies him and i'm like why does everybody just being assholes to each other for no reason i don't get i, I don't get if that is supposed to be endearing or what they want us to feel about it it makes me not like them they're Definitely giving me so many reasons not to like them. <laughs> you know, I get having flaws, but they go a little bit far in this show, in my opinion. But I, I like that scene. And now we uh, realize somebody took the photo. Somebody else knows about the relationship. They see spots of um, hair coloring from uh, the, the hairdresser here. So that, that's how they make that connection. Great investigation stuff. And this is a solid scene here, too. Um, you know, she hid from Navarro the truth about the relationship. She didn't tell Navarro this at first because obviously the circumstances around the murder is that anybody who spoke up about it might get retaliation against them. So um, that's what was keeping her from saying that. But then we find out that she did actually follow up with that and that she told Hank about it and then Hank covered it up. So... There's a conspiracy about, 
and he has his own explanations for that. He's not answering his radio at this point, and um, there's definitely something in the police in this company, this mining company. There's shady stuff going on. I love that stuff. It's classic film noir. There's wider implications of what the police are investigating. I love that type of stuff. You know, Chinatown, all that kind of thing. I definitely dig it. So, you know, that definitely fits. And you might, you know, look at it and be like, oh, it's, you know, a certain agenda and all that. But you know what? It is classic staples of film noir, even if it is an agenda. I'm, I'm okay with it because it makes for an interesting conspiracy storyline, you know. Uh, and another thing in this scene, we got Danvers um, taking the kid in the uh, other room, making mac and cheese. So that's humanizing her a little bit. Because remember, she does have an adopted daughter. So we get to see a little bit of that side of her. And I would have liked to see a bit more of that, but they have this whole uh, other aspect of her character where she's having having conflict with her adopted daughter. So we can't see too much of that, but they put it in here. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how that storyline's going to shake out with her daughter, if I like it or not. I'm not sure. It does seem a bit generic, you know, just generic, oh, moody teenager. But she's getting embroiled in this conspiracy as well, the environmental protests and whatnot. So we will um, get back to that in a bit. You know, I like these car scenes because it's definitely reminiscent of earlier uh, seasons of this show. You know, they even had a trailer cutting all these different scenes together from the different seasons. So that's cool. Um, and they're talking about the mining company that 50% of the population works for it. So anybody could have had a reason to kill the woman. And um, there's also somebody else that they learned used to work at the facility. And now they're, they're going to try to track him down. Nobody knows where he is, etc. So, um, you know, they have different views about it. This might be my favorite scene in the episode here. Because they're actually, like, they, they, this is the one scene in the show so far where they're trying to get a little deeper with it. And it actually kind of pays off and works. Although, you know, Danvers is like, there's nothing supernatural going on. And Navarro thinks it is something new, supernatural going on. At least we have a skeptic believer type of scenario, you know, and that, that parallels with earlier seasons of the show as well, of course. And they're talking about their personal relationships, who they're fucking and whatnot. And I just, I don't care about it, you know, but I like, you know, Navarro saying, do you ever want to just disappear and getting in that emotional headspace that works so i like that part of it here we are at the bodies again hank brings a gift for peter for peter's uh, son and trying to break the ice after he slapped him in the face at the end of or in the middle of last episode so then navarro comes in like why aren't you uh answering your radio you hid information from us and all of that. And, and I like this scene too. Because this guy is definitely deserving of that. You know if you're just screaming at people for no reason. That's one thing. There's a very good reason here. So um, there's insults thrown back and forth. And he's saying you know that girl was sleeping with half of the town. I couldn't report every little thing. He's lying through his teeth. You know I don't even. We don't even know if that's true or not. Um, and then, you know, he insults Danvers saying, maybe I ought to file a report on you for playing Mrs. Robinson with my kid. Of course, a reference to The Graduate, classic movie. And I like that the, that Peter doesn't know <laughs> the reference. That's cool too. But, um, basically he's insinuating that she's like hooking up with him or trying to, uh, tease him like that. I don't even think that's really indicative of their relationship, but she takes exception to it so maybe and she throws the coffee in his face which is assault <laughs> by the way but uh you know i like this scene you know it's a, the the iciness between all of them and you know she's threatening him with filing a report when really i would think that withholding evidence would be a crime in and of itself but of course arresting a police officer somebody he he, he has connections too he's got like these random dudes that are seemingly willing to go to bat for him. So that's one thing. So now between Peter and Danvers, uh, Peter mentions he has a cousin who's a vet. They don't have the forensic person because there's a storm. They can't take off. So they can't actually do the postmortem stuff. So they're going to get some information there from that guy. And now we got Navarro talking to her boyfriend who I've not really enjoyed this relationship because she treats him like shit. 
it's a little bit better this time because he he just wants to learn something about her you know at, I would just say, man, like, find somebody else. <laughs> like, my dude, you gotta move on. <laughs> this woman is not gonna give you what, you what you need, is my opinion on it. But I don't think the show wants me to think that. So that's why I'm bringing it up. But I do like her. You know, she's resistant to talking about her past. And then she starts talking about her mom. It is weird that the guy's, like, specifically, like, tell me about your mom. It's like, maybe, I don't know if he knew something about that going into the conversation, but I would have thought maybe a more general, like, tell me about your, your parents or your how or how you grew up. Tell me about your childhood. Something more generic than asking specifically about the mom, but maybe he heard something. Uh, maybe there's some that line of dialogue I don't remember from previous episodes. But, you know, I like actually getting a little bit of information, a reason to care. Now we're at a protest with uh, the stepdaughter of Danvers, and this is the environmental group. They're talking about the stillbirths, and this company's poisoning us, and we saw the, the water later in the episode. Uh, we've been hearing about the black water, and there's a bunch of shady stuff going on. So it seems like they're, they have something going on there that they are actually correct in what they're protesting about. But we'll have to see later in the episode. I'm sure there's a cover-up going on. Maybe uh, the girl who was murdered found out something she wasn't supposed to know. It's not just the fact that she was protesting. You know, we'll, we'll find out. Um, here, we got a scene with Danvers, and she's leaning into the fridge. I think she's hearing voices, too, and it's like, dude, it's just getting silly. And the stuff that happens at the end of the episode is, is silly, too, to me. But um, here, we got the conflict with the stepdaughter, and... You know, she's like, oh, you are you went to the protest and you're involved with these people. You know what happens to these people because of the murder. And now I get why she doesn't want the lines on the face because she doesn't want her daughter to be associated with these people because of the potential danger. Um, and now that I see that, it's about trying to protect her. I understand last week about why she was uh, being mean about it. But um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily endear us to this character, to uh, the Danvers character. But uh, I do like the way uh, Jodie Foster carries herself, you know, when she's wearing the police uniform. It, it definitely feels like a real cop, you know. So I, I thumbs up to her acting. It's just the, the writing I question a bit. But um, here we got another little hallucination dream scene. And uh, I got some comments, you know, complaining about the supernatural stuff. I got some comments of people saying there was supernatural stuff in season one. And it was like, okay, there was like one dream scene with him chasing Russ chasing uh his child I forget if it was a son or a daughter it doesn't matter there was something like that and then there were these people that worship the yellow king and all of that but they didn't really lean into that too heavy it was just like one a couple little things here and there and the yellow king they worship just because they worship this guy doesn't mean there's actually like a, an entity out there and everything in the story could be explained logically, so it's open to interpretation. Doesn't seem like they're going that route this time. It seems like they really are leaning into it, and there is no other interpretation other than supernatural things going on. You know, that's what I don't like. The ambiguity of season one is what made it good. I, I didn't, you know, I've talked to multiple people about the first season. I was like, did you guys think of season one was supernatural? I have yet to find anybody who says yes to that question <laughs> they didn't interpret it that way so um and there are articles about season four is going to avoid season one's mistake by leaning more into the supernatural and like mistake you mean one of the most classic shows of tv history <laughs> like what are you talking about so case in point a couple little scenes here and there is not the same thing as what we're doing now where it's like ghosts are killing people leading them two dead bodies buried in the ice and stuff like that and here we got another scene of a ghost child who i i guess died in a car accident and that sounds like it's you know because we had the implications the hints that danvers had a her son die in a car accident because of a drunk driver that's why she was so mad at the drunk driver in the first episode uh, it's you know they're trying to be subtle and, and failing in my opinion here I think it's supposed to be the ghost of her son trying to give a message to Navarro. And I think it's corny. I think it's silly. I laugh at it. That's my opinion on it. It's, it's not, I, I don't like it. That's, you know, 
you could you could have your feelings about it, but that's with this show being true detective, it's just it's just a bit much. <laughs> so that's my opinion. Um, here now the sister, Navarro's sister, had an episode, and now they find each other. And um, I don't know. I don't know that we needed that scene necessarily. Trying to cram a bit too much in this episode. You know, there's some things that don't pay off. Um, and here we got the uh, Peter, the d young detective Peter, coming home. And he accidentally uh, knocks something over and wakes people up. Which I, you know, I get being upset about that. And then um, this conflict with the wife. You know, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the wife. I'm not going to lie. Um, I understand where she's coming from, where she wants him to be more present and stuff. And, you know, she, he wasn't always a cop and whatnot. Um, but it's not going to endear anybody to her when she calls him. You're, you were just a sweet idiot. Like, you call, in the first episode, she's like, you, you're, I can't believe it fell for a white boy who's a sweet idiot. Like, why would you, I, I don't know. I don't know why you would think that that sounds good. Um, I hate that. So I don't, I don't, I don't like her just straight up. And I think I'm supposed to feel differently, I guess. Um, but you know, I understand wanting to have somebody around when you got a young kid. I totally get that. Um, so I suppose it's mixed feelings. And now we got, uh, Danvers investigating here. I don't remember exactly why she goes there and there doesn't seem any payoff to the scene. So I'm not really sure that this scene was necessary other than she sees in this house that the water is messed up. So she has some reason to believe what the protesters are saying now. Although, you know, we've been hearing about that for a while. So you'd think she'd know that. I love these scenes with the frozen bodies. It's freaky, spooky, nice horror thing. I, I would say thumbs up to the uh, production designers on all the, the dead bodies and whatnot. They, uh, they did a great job with that. They nailed it. Um, so I also heard that they based it on some of the dra drawings from the Divine Comedy, Dante's Inferno. That's cool. And, um, yeah, just great designs in general. So the vets here, and it's just like, it's too little information that we get sometimes, you know, and we get like one little thing and the vet's just like that he died before they froze. I, I almost feel like the detectives should have been able to figure that out. They don't need a, a vet to come here and tell them. Um, but he's like, probably cardiac arrest, they died because they were scared, and then they froze. Because, you know, the things he said about freezing to death, you would think that cops in the area would know about that, right? I mean, I'm sure that they've had to deal with that. Um, it's a harsh environment, after all. So, that's, uh, it's just a small criticism. It's a good scene and whatnot, but it's like, we didn't get too much out of that. Uh, so now we found, I guess, the, the boyfriend... Navarro's bartender hookup <laughs> he knows somebody who knows where the guy that they're looking for is and then they pull up to this um, nomad tribe and whatnot one little thing is that this guy used to work at the scientific facility but there are no there's no tax information or paperwork about this guy I don't know that he could get high I guess he, he could get hired under the table but I don't know something about that doesn't sound right but I guess that would be why they don't know he exists, right? He was um, definitely not legally allowed to work there. Maybe that makes sense after all. I don't like them just barging into this guy's house, you know, breaking the laws and whatnot. Especially because this community is already very anti-police. It's not, it's not helpful. And I just don't like police doing that in general. So it's just another reason not to like these cops. But we got this guy here and he's very hostile. And they try to explain what happened. See, my thing is, like, they could have said stuff through the door, like, hey, we, ha we have some questions about Annie. Your friends at and co-workers are dead and whatnot. We they could have started with that instead of just breaking in. Um, so there's a standoff here, and the guy asks Navarro what her uh, tribal name is, and she doesn't know because her mom didn't tell her. That was something uh, that we, we got in one of those flashback scenes. And then, um, you know, he doesn't really give them that much information either. You know, I, I don't, like, it's a, it's a cool scene, I guess, but we didn't really learn anything. And then we leave, and then we're at the hospital, and we got another, like, this guy, he was the guy who was frozen in the last episode who screamed, and he turns out it was alive. 
And he's freaky looking. The acting is great. He really sells it. And it, it's spooky. Uh, I don't know how realistic it is. Somebody would have to let me know. Uh, I suppose I could buy it. Weirder things have happened. But in this scene, you know, we sh he she was awoken. We awoke somebody from the ice. We saw that in the first episode. So as the audience, we're, we didn't learn anything from the scene at all. And then there's crazy stuff going on in the hallway. The hillbillies that Hank hired are fighting with the cops. So I'm curious what's going on there. But my gut instinct is that it's a ruse to distract these two from whatever interviewing that guy or something. I don't know. Maybe they wanted to actually kill the guy. But then, um, you know, we got this shot where we track back and the, the guy sits up in a creepy way. My thing with this is just the pacing is not right. Like it, it happens so quick. The moment can't really breathe. It doesn't have that same impact because it, it just this scene, you know, we, we got to get to the end of the episode. We could have cut out some of the stuff about who they're fucking earlier and spent more time on that would have been better. Um, but he sits up and then he's like, Oh, I'm, I, I know your mother told me to tell you. I just think of the exorcist. Um, so I don't know this scene. It just felt kind of goofy to me. And we're definitely going like ghosts are talking to people and possessing people. And it, it, I don't know. It's just, I just roll my eyes at this, these parts, honestly, the acting is cool though. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And then they, they unlocked this girl's phone. They didn't explain how they unlocked it. <laughs> we cracked it. Um, I don't think that's a thing, bro. <laughs> Unless you just find a combination from somewhere in her life, you know, I don't know, a relative's birth year or something like that. But, uh, you know, it's another, it's like a cliched horror movie, you know, all oh, there's something out there. Oh no, my name is this. And if you don't, uh, uh, right before she says the important thing, it's like, ah, <laughs> it's just kind of goofy. It's just kind of goofy. So that's uh, my opinion on the supernatural stuff is it's goofy. I like the investigation stuff, the character stuff I'm mixed on, not leaning towards not liking it. So my opinion on this episode is sli is slightly better. Um, but also slightly worse because we're leaning heavy into the supernatural stuff and I think it's goofy. So that's my opinion on this episode. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. It's been your boy Shuggy. We'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching, everybody. Peace out.